What the Falcons do? Rise up. Welcome to Rise Up Reactions, the show where we talk all things Falcons, NFL, Georgia sports, and in general the sports news of the day. I'm your host, Dr. Lee Denning, lifelong sports fan, and today I'm finally finishing up my discussion of the uh, NFL conferences, how I think they're going to do, where I think predictions are, additions, subtractions from the teams, and we're finishing off with what I think is going to be the best division in the NFL this year with the AFC West. And let me just start by saying, Somebody has to lose and be fourth place in this division. I don't really have a great idea of who it's going to be because there's been so, so much change within this division. There have been a lot of key additions for all of the teams involved, and I think it's going to be an incredibly competitive division. So right out the gate, before we even start on anything, each one of these teams have to play the other ones six times in total. And in addition, they are also playing the NFC West. So you have West on West this year, which is also arguably the best division in the NFC. So right there, out the gate, you've got at least nine games. I don't think Seattle is going to be that tough this year, but San Francisco, the Rams, and Arizona, they're all going to be tough opponents. So nine games right out the gate are 50-50s on every single one of these teams. That is a tough schedule. That's more than half of their season for every single team on here. Now, all the other teams will look at them as likely tough opponents as well. So I think it's going to balance itself out in the end. But somebody's going to emerge as the clear front runner, and somebody's going to be at the back end. But I don't think it's necessarily going to be with a losing record. So right off the gate, I want to start with the Broncos. So in addition to the games I've already mentioned, their 50-50 games include Indianapolis, Baltimore, and uh, Tennessee. So... One of the big things that they have done this offseason, they traded in a marquee trade traded Russell Will for Russell Wilson, who is going to immediately make them better. Jerry Judy did get into a little bit of legal trouble, which it seems like it's not going to be that big of a deal. Uh, he likely will face some sort of punishment from the NFL. Uh, it's going to be really strange to see him get a punishment when there are still circulating rumors and accusa uh, accusations against another high-profile player in the NFL uh, for another orange-based team. We won't mention him here. I've already talked in depth about him. But anyways, they also added Randy Gregory at the, uh, the 11th hour from the Dallas Cowboys who couldn't get a deal done. It's going to really anchor that defense uh, where you're losing, uh, where they lost Von Miller. Uh, they also added Calvin Anderson, Tom Compton, Billy Turner, DJ Jones. Uh, and then in the draft, they got Nick Benito in the second round, Greg Dulcich as a tight end to replace Noah Fant, who they lost. Uh, Damari Mathis, and then in the sixth round, uh, sorry, fifth round, they got Luke Wattenberg, who I think is going to be a pretty good developmental uh, center. But again, we'll see what happens with him. Uh, guys that they lost, already talked about Noah Fant in the trade for Russell Wilson. Then uh, they all lost both Bridgewater and Locke. Uh, Deshaun Hamilton off of the wide receiver core, Cameron Fleming off the line, Bobby Massey, Shelby Harris, and Kyle Fuller in the secondary. Um, so, you know, they've had some. Notable losses there, but I still think with the addition of Russell Wilson, they were still a 7-10 and team last year. The addition of Russell Wilson, regardless of the schedule, makes them competitive at a very high level. So, honest to God, just looking at their schedule and thinking about what they could do, I think their ceiling is 13-4. and I don't think they win all of those games. And then I think their uh, floor is only about 10-7, and maybe, maybe 9-8. and I do have them uh, going 11-6. and which we'll see at the end where that puts them in regards to the rest of the teams. Moving on, we have the Chiefs. Uh, the Chiefs were you know, basically getting an overtime drive away from making it to the Super Bowl last year. However, arguably, the man that has helped make Patrick Mahomes' career in Tyreek Hill is no longer on the team. He was traded to the Miami Dolphins and signed a heck of a lucrative contract for a wide receiver. So, you know, we'll see what happens with him uh, in Miami. But it will definitely hurt the Chiefs regardless of who they add to fill his spot. So, right out the gate, the other games that they have in addition to the uh, AFC and NFC West, they also have um, Indianapolis, Tennessee, uh, Buffalo, and Cincinnati. So they're going to have some really tough opponents here. Tampa Bay is likely going to be a really, really tough opponent. Buffalo, we can rematch there. Cincinnati, they have a much harder schedule than anybody else because they finished first in the division last year. So by finishing first, they guaranteed themselves a harder schedule this season. So 
honestly, let's look at the, what they've added and lost. They added Ronald Jones in the backfield. They've added uh, Marquez Valdez Scandling, uh, Juju Smith Schuster, Justin Reed, Frank, Frank Clark, and then in the draft they picked up Trent McDuffie, George Karlaftis, who I thought was a steal at pick. I think thirty overall. It might have been twenty nine, but I think it was thirty overall. And then they managed to uh, get Sky Moore uh, for wide receiver who I think will probably be the best guy to replace Tyreek Hill in the long run, though they did add, like I said, Juju and MBS in there to try and help out with production as well. Uh, and then they also got Brian Cook and Leo Chanel uh, in the second and third round. Um, and again, guys that they're losing, Tyreek Hill, Alex Okafor, Melvin Ingram, Mike Hughes, Tyran Matthew is a major loss for them, and then Daniel Sorensen as well. So, again, ceiling for them, uh, because of the toughness of their schedule, I think 13-4 and four is as good as you could hope for. 10 and 7 is probably the floor there, but I do have them going 12 and 5. I think they're going to find a way, and I think we really see Patrick Mahomes if he is really as good as his contract suggests. I think we all know that he is a good player. He's a really phenomenal quarterback, top 10 easily. But how much of that was Tyreek Kill? We'll see. They still have Travis Kelsey to throw to as well, so they have several weapons to move the ball around. And this is also a big contract year for Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. Is he going to finally step up and be that first-round draft pick that they intended him to be? So who knows? we got a lot, a lot of football to go here with them, and we'll see what happens with them. Moving on, we got the Las Vegas Raiders. It's still weird to say Las Vegas, but you know they've got a beautiful stadium out there. would love to go to it sometime. Um, so again... Additional opponents, they have Indianapolis, Tennessee, and the New Orleans Saints. Those are really their only additional 50-50 games. But, again, not easy opponents here. So, they extended Carr in the offseason. They did make a marquee trade for Devontae Adams. Derek Carr and Devontae Adams played together at Fresno State. They had an amazing connection. It's part of the reason that Devontae Adams got drafted in the second round uh, when it came to that year for the draft. Uh, they did re-sign Hunter Renfro. They re-signed Max Crosby. They signed Chandler Jones Bilal, and uh, Bilal Nichols. And this is probably one of my favorite drafts just because it seemed to be a mostly SEC draft. And I'm from Carrollton, Georgia. So their first pick in the draft was in the third round. And they took uh, one of the guys who's been uh, developed from Carrollton and played at Kentucky, Dylan Parham. Congratulations, man. You've done amazing. I, I can't wait to see you playing on, uh, playing on the offensive line out there. Uh, you're going to be great, and I wish you a lot of success as a former Carrollton Trojan myself, so good luck, sir. Um, and then the other guys that they added on, Samir White, Georgia guy, I think he is highly underrated. He was going to be a top uh, 64 pick overall uh, if he played for any other team. Because he plays at Georgia, there is so much just changing at the running back. We run with about three or four guys all year long, and they are all four- and five-star recruits who run incredibly well. So he's going to be a hidden gem, and especially since they did not extend Josh Jacobs into his fifth-year option, he could very well end up being the starter. I think he's the clear backup to the start of this season. Um, and then you've also got uh, Nick Farrell and Matthew Butler. Again, all SEC guys here. So uh, as far as losses, they lost Marcus Mariota and Brian Edwards both to the Falcons. Not necessarily make or break pieces of their team, but you know, good to see that they'll have some connection there. They did lose Yannick Ngakwe, which hurts. However, they replaced him with uh, uh, with a few other guys. So they um, they lost Carl Nassib, they lost Say Jones, they lost Richie Incognito, Corey Littleton, KJ Wright, Casey Hayward, and Desmond Trufant. So again, they they've lost a lot of pieces, but they gained a lot in the draft and it through free agency as well. So I have them. Ceiling wise, going 12 and 5, I don't think they hit that. I have their floor at about 8 and 9, and I do have them going 10 and 7 when I run out the entire season. Uh, and finally, we're going to go to the Chargers. I'm really excited for the Chargers. I think they have one of the best teams in football this year, and we've been saying it for years and years. They underperform time and time again. They made some really stupid decisions with clock management last year. Uh, otherwise, they probably could have gone on to the playoffs, and who knows what would have happened. Uh, for them. But again, uh, in addition to the 50-50 games we've already talked about, they've got Miami, Indianapolis, and Tennessee. Not the toughest schedule in the world here. Um, they've re-signed Mike Williams. They got Gerald Everett at tight end. They've gotten Kyle Van Noy, Khalil Mack in a marquee trade. He's going to be phenomenal for them. Uh, Sebastian Joseph Day, J.C. Jackson. And again, one of the guys that is also a Carrollton Trojan who was on the Falcons and finally got Pro Bowl recognition this past year, Josh Harris. Pro Bowl long snapper. I know a lot of people don't think that's a very important position. 
Josh, to my knowledge, has never made a mistake that cost the team the game or cost a, a, a problem with either the punt or an extra point or a field goal. So Josh is a phenomenal long snapper. He's probably going to play into his mid-late 30s, and they've got him on a four-year deal for pretty cheap overall. Pretty much just a veteran minimum, but we'll see. They have the option to get rid of him after it looks like a couple of years. Hopefully they don't. I think he'll possibly win a ring with the Chargers. Um, and then in the draft, they also uh, added a couple of guys. They added Zion Johnson, one of the best guards in the, uh, in the draft. They got JT Woods, Isaiah Spiller to back up uh, running back there. And then Jamari uh, Salyer out of Georgia, another guy who has played many different positions on that line. He will probably be a backup to probably either guards or tackle. He played a lot of left tackle at Georgia and did pretty well overall. But he will probably start as a backup and possibly develop into a starter by the end of his career. Um, they did lose Jerry Cook, Ryan Smith, Michael Schofield, Justin Jones, and Uchenna Nwosu. So not a lot of crazy losses there. But I have them reasonably because I think their schedule is among the easier and their team is the most complete overall. I think they go 14 and 3 as their ceiling, 11 and 6 as their floor, and I do have them going 13 and 4. So that would put the Chargers at first place, Kansas City at a close second place, uh, and then you've got uh, the Broncos going third and the Raiders going fourth, and all of the teams, when I ran this out, have a winning record. Now, is it going to play out that way? Very likely not. I think the Raiders or the Broncos will end up being at the bottom of the division just because I think the other teams are very talent-laden, but who knows. We'll see what happens with it. If you agree with what, I, what, what I've been talking about or if you like what I've said, please consider hitting that like button and uh, subscribing to the channel. If you disagree with me, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. I'd love to have a good debate with you about it. Um, or if you have any additional thoughts, I'd love to hear about it. But until next time, guys, rise up.